Welcome to the Engineering Room. This is an additional series of longer form conversational style chats with influential people from software development. And it's meant to complement the, the more regular channel content. This series is sponsored by Equal Experts. Equal Experts is a product software development consultancy with a network of over a thousand technology consultants globally. They increase the pace of innovation by using modern software engineering practices that embrace continuous delivery, security and operability from the outset. My guest today is Alan Holub, a computer scientist, author, educator and consultant. He's written extensively on the C, C++ and Java programming languages and on object-oriented programming in general. He also writes about and teaches agile development and has written for many influential magazines and journals over the years, including one of my old favorites, the sadly missed Dr. Dobbs journal. And uh, Alan, thank you very much for joining us today. You're welcome, my pleasure. Um, I, 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 I looked up some of the stuff, some of your writing, some of your videos and so on in, mm. in kind of prepping for this. And one of the things that resonated with me um, that I like a lot, and, and as we were discussing before this episode, one of the dangers of this is that we're going to be agreeing too much. Uh, <laughs> but you, you, in one of your videos, you quoted Andy Hunt, who said that agile has come to, to mean doing half of Scrum badly and using Jira, which I really <laughs> like. I, 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 laughed, <laughs> I, I laughed out loud when you said it. So, so what, what, what's broken about Agile? What's broken? What's not broken about Agile? It's probably, <laughs> it's probably a better question. You know, I, I, I still use the word. Um, unlike some of, some, some of the people that I know that are kind of high-end Agile people, including Andy, right, is that the, the um, who signed the Agile Manifesto, um, they're avoiding the word entirely, is that it's turned into such a steaming pile of garbage that nobody wants to touch it including the people that invented it yeah. so that's a problem you know and the the um i'm still using it because well i'm i work as a consultant and i have to use the word or else nobody will hire me but the um the thing that i do has essentially nothing to do with what people think of as agile anymore yeah you know and i, I don't know how many times I, like on twitter or some platform like that i'll see somebody saying i hate agile it's awful if we only paid attention to each other as human beings and worked small and did things iteratively, we wouldn't have a pro, you know, I'd, that'll work great. We don't need any of this agile stuff. And I'm going, you just described this agile stuff. So what, <laughs> yeah. What's going on, right? Is the, <laughs> so, you know, people have come to, uh, basically, as Andy says, it's half of Scrum Badly and Jira is that they, it's turned into tools and bad processes and all this other yeah. stuff. I, I was, I was, I tweeted the other day on, <laughs> I, I was probably being a little bit too sarcastic, but I said, you know, I really have nothing against Scrum at all. If Scrum is just fine. If we, uh, all we have to do is get rid of the sprint and the Scrum master and the product owner and the backlog and the sprint review and the uh, notions of accountability and the notions of commitment and uh, the certificates, and I have nothing against Scrum at all. <laughs> and I, and I, that's kind of my feeling right now is that, you know, the tr truth to tell, seriously, the, if you read the Scrum guide, it's not going to do much damage. Yeah. It's mostly harmless to use Douglas Adams, to quote Douglas, Douglas Adams, is that uh, Scrum as described is essentially nothing. Right. It's a lightweight wrapper and a few ridiculous meetings that you're supposed to go to. And OK, fine. If you really want to do that, I don't care. Um, it's all the stuff that people have added to it over the years that has made it awful. Right. Yeah. And the, the the my main issue with it is that it's so lightweight that you could just get rid of it is that, you know, X, XP works fine without Scrum. In fact, Scrum was originally invented or pushed in the original book. If you go, go get uh, Schwaber and Beetle's original book on Scrum. Um, on the on the cover of the book, it says Scrum is basically a wrapper that you can put around extreme programming in order to make it more palatable for management. Yeah. And that's all that's all that Scrum was when it started out. And if you look at it that way, well, fine. But um, the point is, is that Scrum XP without Scrum works fine, and Scrum without XP doesn't work at all. So what are we doing? You know, why why bother? And the it, I don't, I don't know. It's a, it's a source of frustration for me, obviously. And, and of course, yeah. don't get me started on safe. 
<laughs> yeah, talk yeah, about so the I, abomination. <laughs> I, 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 quite, I quite like I quite like Martin Fowler's description of say sh- say shitty agile for enterprises. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 I, 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 I gather from the way that you talk. I, I, obviously, I agree. Uh, one, one, of, one of my takes is that what is is that one of the reasons why why agile. Why well, Scrum kind of became synonymous with Agile because it was the easiest one to cheat, as, as you. I, I think I'm, that's kind of saying. I, saying. Yeah. I don't you know, think it's so much that is what is the original intent was to make something that actually was Agile more palatable to the business, and by that, what they mean is more acceptable to somebody who doesn't really understand or want to be Agile. Yeah, right? that's, I, 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 that's no. that's why it exists. That's the very reason for it to exist. So. Of course, people are going to then run with it because there's a, there's a there's then a focus on something that you do around agile rather than being agile itself. Yeah, am I, am I making sense? So as soon as you start focusing on Scrum rather than on being agile, you end up focusing on the wrong things. You focus on things that make it palatable to management rather than focusing on actually being agile. Yeah, right? yeah. It's built. It's built in. It's part of the. It's just you know. You can't do Scrum without that. It's it's a it's it's built in, and you know, and there's a bunch of stuff in Scrum now, which is, in my cynical mind, I'm going. This is just pandering to large corporate clients in order to sell more certificates. Yeah, um, things like the notions of accountability and commitment. It's just appalling to me. I hate it. Right. So do you? To it, to it's um, uh, quoting Bob Marshall. Right. Is that he thinks of this as the language of violence. And yes. I kind of agree with that, right? It's yeah. you know accountability. Is you do what I say, and I'm going to hold you accountable for that. And I, the the that stuff was deliberately removed from Scrum for for years, and now they put it back, and that's kind of appalling. I, why did they do that? And all I can think of is well, well, we need to sell more certificates, and the, our big corporate clients are really big on accountability, so back it goes into the Scrum Guide, and you know, and then all of the Scrum trainers are parroting that language. I just, it drives me crazy when a scrum trainer just quotes the scrum guide chapter and verses if it's the Bible. And they talk about, about inspection and adaption. And I go, that's, that's a, <laughs> what a weird phrase, adaption. Who, who ever says adaption? What does that mean, right? And it's not as if, it's, it, you know, an inspect and adapt has been part of Agile from day one. So yeah. scrum claiming that annoys me. But the kind of quoting of the Scrum guy back at me just drives me crazy. And I'm, I'm going I'm, I'm, just... I'm, I'm to I'm, I'm quote you back at you because it was another one okay. of the things that I picked up that I really liked. You said, Agile has become a priesthood where the priests don't understand the rituals they're telling people to follow. I think that's exactly yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. You know, and uh, well, some of them do. That's the annoying thing, right? I know a couple of, yeah. um, of the Scrum.org trainers. And... Um, Without exception, I really respect them. They really know what they're talking about. They yeah. really understand Agile properly. But they still fall back onto this chapter and verse thumping, you know, scrum guide thumping, almost biblical approach to it. And I, so, it frustrates so, so, me that somebody who's basically good would then do that because that's what Ken Schwaber is requiring, right? Is that they, they have to use his material and they, they present the stuff that he tells them to present and how agile is that to just mimic something that somebody else gives you? And I, I, I almost wish that all of these people would just disassociate themselves from the scrum organizations that they're associated with. But they don't do that because it, because it's a business decision. And in other words, they're saying there's a huge market for people doing scrum training. So I'm going to position myself as a scrum trainer. And that I, I don't have any, I, I can't find any fault in that. There's nothing wrong with that at all, right? Everybody's got to make a living. And if they're going to position themselves as scrum trainers, that's fine. But I still find it frustrating as that because it's kind of pushing when you have good people who know what they're doing, pushing something that I think of as not good. Um, it's it's sort of driving the industry in a direction that I wish it was not driving. In. So, um, yeah, know, it's it, it's 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 a difficult it's a difficulty when commercial pressures don't align, align well with good outcomes. It's a, it's a very, well, and that's it's the a problem with Scrum. Problem. It's the problem yeah. with Scrum in general and safety even more so. Right. Is that it's. Yeah. As soon as m- money gets involved, it corrupts everything. Yeah, and I think a lot of the flaws that I see in Scrum were driven by money. It was, you know, somebody saying, "Well, we have to make this more 
palatable. I keep using the word palatable, but making it more palatable to our corporate clients because that's where our yeah. money is coming from. So yeah. we're going to modify Scrum to make it something that's more acceptable to the big corporations because that's where our money is coming from. As money is driving, is driving the whole process in the direction of the status quo, rather so, than the radical thing that Agile is. Yes. So, 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 so one, one, one of my, I, I, I've been fortunate to be close to the birth of a few good ideas you know over, over my, my time and and my biggest impression is that you know the the people that came up with the ideas their their their, their primary response is that's not what we meant yeah. <laughs> nearly, nearly always and 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 when it's a, an important ideal as i think that well i know you and i both believe that agile is um then it feels quite painful. I, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I still use the term agile because I'm a consultant too. Yeah. But you know, I, I, I think I, I think of myself as kind of a card carrying agilista. You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm a <laughs> agilista. I, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Neither <are> agilista. <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 a, I'm a believer. I, I, I think that it's it represents a significant step forward in understanding and practicing software development i i i, I, I yeah. read the, I, I read this amazing book uh, a few years ago which is about physics it's, it's called the beginning of infinity mm -hmm. by david deutsch and in it he expresses the way that some ideas kind of open up an infinity of possibilities and i think mm -hmm. agile is one of those if, if you think of, if you think at the limits of software development something like a waterfall approach to you doing all the big upfront design thing is fundamentally constrained however smart you are because you've got to get you've got to get all the decisions right at the start when you don't know anything agile is completely open-ended and an evolutionary approach to incrementally developing a system which means that you can you can build systems that you can't even imagine when you start yeah but that scares the pants off of people it does, right? it's, but people, it's true. Business people are terrified of that. It's true and it's necessary. <laughs> yeah. Right. But you you talk to some business people and what they want is certainty. Yeah. And they can't get it. So they live in this fantasy land of imagining that they have certainty when they don't. But they still keep demanding it. And then when they don't, when things don't work out the way they want them to, they either drop into blame or yeah. they drop into craziness. Yeah. So, you know, estimation, right? They say, well, that estimate was wrong. So we have to get better at estimation. And I'm going, you can't, nobody can get better at estimation. It's not possible. <laughs> yeah. Right. If, yeah. Because something always comes up. Yeah. So if something always comes up, then whatever you estimated is based on the wrong thing. You're estimating the wrong stuff. Yeah. And then they say, well, we'll reestimate. And I'm going, have you read any books on lean in your life? <laughs> is that we do some work and then something changes and then we do the work over again and then something changes yeah. and we do the same work over again and over and over and over. And that takes up huge amounts of time, which makes your schedule slip even further. Yeah. And yeah. I, it, again, it's kind of crazy making is that the, the um, you know, agile means agile literally and the, <laughs> the they don't want that though they want it to be something predictable and rigid and and uh, yeah. uh, controllable embracing in change where there's no control where control is not possible right yeah and the, yeah so there you are and it's a it's a you know often i find that when i come into a company as a consultant um, depending on the company and the size, it's actually possible to get people to understand and start doing agile stuff. It's just that they never understood what it was. The problem yeah. is not evilness or evilness. If that's the word. The problem is not evil. The problem is lack of education. So yeah. they don't really understand what it's about. And often when they do understand what's sort of about, what it's about, they actually prefer it over what they're doing now. In other words, somebody who's like an estimate guy saying, I have to have an estimate, you know, when are you going to deliver? And I'm going, well, why are you doing that? And the answer comes back typically as I'm not going to invest $5 million into a project and not know whether it's going to work or not in a year. Yeah. So I've got to have estimates so that I can check progress against the estimate to see if we're going to deliver. And I'm saying, well, what if we actually deliver? Yeah. What if I give you something in two weeks and you can look at it and see if it's right or not, and we can adjust it. And if not, we can move on to the next thing and we'll do the most important stuff first. And that way you know that you're not going to fail because the stuff that really matters, that's done. Yeah. And often people say, gosh, that would be great. Let's do that. <laughs> and then they say, what do you call that? And I go, well, that's <laughs> agile. And they go, no, 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 that's not agile. <laughs> but, the, 
<laughs> but the, the point is, is that once you understand that way of thinking, it kind of makes sense. But the larger the organization, the harder it is to get people to work in a different way than what the organization is pushing is that the system, I'm a big systems guy. And the, the agile is a system. It's an organizational system. Mm -hmm. And it encompasses the entire organization, not just the engineering department or a team or something. And the problem, of course, is that with, with big systems like that is that they, it's almost like they become sentient as they take on a life of their own that's completely separate from any of the people in the organizations. The people leave, people come, uh, and it doesn't matter. The system kind of forces the people into the mold of the system. And that happens even up at the sea level. So, you know, the, the, in some organizations, a new CEO can come along and change things. But if the system is big enough and firmly enough established, even a CEO can't change it. Mm -hmm. So that's a, the, only, the only solution to that is basically to rip everything apart, maybe put it back together differently, maybe leave it, leave it apart. But not many people are willing to do that, particularly with a big corporation for reason, you know, I understand the reasons. So I've kind of given up on those guys is that the, the, the big organizations, the systems that they work in don't allow them to change in any kind of significant way. And the most I can do as a consultant is nibble around the edges, is introduce TDD and things that'll give them a 5% improvement maybe or a 2% mm -hmm. improvement. They're not going to get the, you know, the times the X improvements that you would get if you really worked in an agile way. And yeah. it's just part and parcel of the way that kind of thing works. And that, you know, and often I I see those those same companies move backwards. I, I I had a had a consulting gig a few years ago that was for a company that was so awful that it's given me an almost infinite supply of stories about how not to do things. And um, they were moving backwards as fast as they possibly could. When I when I went in there, they were doing Scrum badly, um, but at least the teams were actual cross functional teams. Mm -hmm. And I worked with them for about eight, <clears throat> eight months, and at the end of the eight months, the the CTO was forcing them back into having a front end team and a back end team and an architecture team and a UX team. And I was going, this is crazy. All this is going to do is slow you down. And yeah. they, they would, they were, they said, well, these were people who said, we hired you to, to teach TDD. So shut up. You talk about anything <laughs> other than TDD, you are out of here. And the person who was running the agile transition was a tyrant who had come up with this kind of wacky version of scrum and she held, she held the, the, the workers in contempt. She was always rolling her eyes talking about, oh, learned helplessness. Where does this learned helplessness come from? And I'm going, this is not learned helplessness. This is actual helplessness. And it's because you keep telling them what to do. Yeah. And as long as you're telling them what to do, they can't do stuff on their own. So they don't want to do stuff and you're punishing them when they do. So why yeah. do you expect them to suddenly be agile if you're going to punish them if they're agile? And um, she fired me basically when I said that. And then the person I was doing this as a subcontract and the main contractor talked to her and got her to back down from that. But basically, if you disagreed with her, you were fired. That was the that was the modus operandi around there. And it's it's that was, you know, it's an extreme case, but I see stuff like that happening all the time. And it's, again, it's frustrating. Um, but the, there we are. Right. That's the reality of the way a lot of companies work. It is, so, yeah, and 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 there is there is some where there's, there's just no hope of change. I, I, as you say, one of the things that I recognise though, um, very strongly is, I'd agree with you. I, I think it's off. It, it's often about education. As yeah. it, you know, no, nobody in that kind of dysfunctional organisation, nobody's enjoying it much. Nobody thinks they're winning usually. Yeah. Yeah, unless they, unless unless they're really crazy i i did i did come across <laughs> one, one guy in an organization we did an exercise we, we, we were doing some based on some of the accelerate stuff so we were, we were doing an exercise in kind of the the western model of um mm -hmm. organizational uh evaluation and we kind of evaluated and he he just kind of scored everything to try and make sure that he just got the best score yeah so right he's got <laughs> he's got he's got everything was brilliant everything was brilliant they were, they, they were releasing software kind of once every six months and had a huge backlog of bugs every individual developer was 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 a silo working on his own but he thought it was great but but usually that's not the case usually people you know know the problems and i think a huge you know, huge parts yeah. of agile is giving allowing the people that are in the work to make the choices about how to do the make the work better well, you know, in individuals and interactions is that it's all if, if you're Indeed. not happy, if you're not happy, you're not doing it right. 
If you're not having yeah. a good time, you're not doing it right. Yeah. And the the that's probably the best indicator you can have about how agile the organization is, is how happy yeah. is everybody. It's, you know, it's, it's, cool. it's, that's, it's funny you should say that. I've not heard anybody else say that before, but that's that's one of the things that I've said is for, for years, one of my consultants' tricks is going into an organization. As a consultant, you know, you need to get that quick take on where people are at and you know, to, to be able to start landing and yeah. delivering value. One of mine is absolutely that. How much fun are these people having? Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, do the team feel like a team? Are they, you know, enjoying being one another's company? Well, well, yeah. and are, are, one another? are they are they worried about being punished? Are they worried about yeah, yeah. deadlines? Right. All the things that yeah. make it not fun <laughs> tend yeah. to be dysfunctional from an agile perspective. Yeah. It's, it's it's one of the thing one of the things that I, I I'm I I don't know I don't know what you think about the the accelerate metrics and uh, and that stuff but one of the things that I I really like about that is you know as well as saying you know doing certain practices allow you to do you know deliver better software faster and all those kinds of things it really focuses on things like you know your, your work life balance and how much fun people are having how much they enjoy their job and they're committed to it those things matter a great deal that they're, they're not they're not only side effects of working this way, they're part of working this way because when people are having fun and are engaged, they do a better job. Yeah. <clears throat> so the, the, you know, the, the accelerate metric, the problem that I have with accelerate metrics is that they are still metrics. Mm -hmm. And I have a problem with metrics in general. And I have a problem with the notion of productivity. Assign I, I brought this up on Twitter once and Nicole came down on me to the point that we haven't really interacted since then, that how dare you say that this doesn't have anything to do with productivity. And maybe we just had very different ideas about what mm -hmm. the word productivity meant. Um, in fact, definitely that was the problem. And unfortunately we haven't had a discussion on Twitter since then, so who knows? But the, the um, I don't think that, I think that the metrics are productivity metrics if you're focusing on the ops side. But when you start focusing on the dev side, it becomes much fuzzier. And look at something like um, uh, deployment frequency. Is the deployment frequency on one hand can, if it's if it is low, it can be an it can be an indicator, an indirect indicator. So that's another problem with the metrics. They're all indirect indicators. They don't they're not actionable. They don't tell you exactly what to work on. But you go, okay, we've got a low deployment frequency. What what does that mean? And it could mean that your stories are too big. It could mean that you have too much work in progress. It could mean there's some kind of uh, dependency that needs to be resolved. There's a lots of reasons why that could happen. The fact that it tells you there's something here, well, that's good, right? I, I have nothing wrong with that. It's kind of like uh, like uh, mutation testing, right? Is mutation testing is great, but it doesn't really tell you much. It says, you know, there's something wrong. Figure it out, right? Yeah. <laughs> and the the um, the um, so as long as the team is treating the metric like that and as long as the metric is not escaping to management then they're great mm -hmm. but when the metric escapes to management they go our deployment frequency is low crack that whip tote that bail right is that we you know you've got to work harder and you got to work faster and you got to start working overtime in order to bring up that deployment and i'm going what is going on here right so it's like any metric it's too easy to abuse and when you do abuse it, you introduce dysfunction. And I really, I'm, I'm nervous about that. So metrics in general, I, I tend, when I do things as a consultant, I tend to avoid hard metrics because mm -hmm. it's too easy for them to go off the deep end with them and start pushing people to do the wrong things, focusing on output instead of outcomes and that kind of stuff. And I, metrics are almost all output related, uh, particularly the lean metrics. And though, again, I think they have real value inside the team. As soon mm -hmm. as they start escaping out to management, unless management is really kind of enlightened management and understands how lean works, and that's very rare, um, they're going to be abused, is that they're going to cause damage. And accelerate metrics are no different than any other metric that way. Is that it's, uh, it's I, I, so, so I, I, I mostly agree with you on that, but I. Oh, I, good. We found something not to agree on. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the slight. The slight caveat. The slight caveat. So, so I certainly agree. You, you've obviously worked in some really dysfunctional places. <laughs> I, I have. This is the life of a consultant, right? Is that if things are going well, they don't call me. <laughs> but, but the the uh, I, I think one of the one of the things that I like about the uh, the um, 
the, the Dora metrics is mm -hmm. is that that slightly indirect picture. So um, so you know you you mentioned you mentioned the deployment frequency. You can you know you, so it doesn't it doesn't make a value judgment on how you fix that, and it doesn't tell you. You know, which thing to fix but if you've got a good score on deployment frequency if you're doing well on deployment frequency then your life's probably easier I, i'm from a continuous delivery point I of view the way the way the, 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 the way the way the way that the way that i describe continuous delivery is working so your software is always releasable so one of the ways that that means if you're working in a xp style continuous integration frame is i want to commit my code it's not a finished feature but i'm happy for it to be deployed into production Right. Uh, and, you know, if, if that's happening and it doesn't affect the way that I'm working, that's quite a good place to be because I'm getting very clear feedback about where well, I am at and the progress that I'm it, making. I've seen it not be a good place to be, right? Because the yeah. deployment frequency ultimately is a function of throughput. And as soon as you start focusing on throughput, you're focusing on output. And I've seen, again, maybe it's because I, <laughs> I work for some screwed up organizations. But many times what I see is people pushing garbage out the door faster because they're being judged on something like deployment frequency. Well, that's, 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 the, bit, no that's the bit. Well, that, that's, that's the bit that I think is important is that you can't choose one of them. You, you can't, you can't choose one of the Dora metrics. You've got that, that they are a set. And so you don't. Well, yeah, but there's no, there's no <clears throat> metric for value. Well, there's, there's no way to put a number on value. I, 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 right. I think that's, I think that's fair. I think that's an omission and, but I think it's an understandable one. So the 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 the, the stability metrics are, are quality, you know, a measure of the quality of the software that we can produce. Throughputs a measure of the, the efficiency with which we can produce software of that quality. And you're kind of balancing those things together, it seems to me. The one of the things that that, that I kind of like and 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 promote is the idea of working experimentally and Maybe the you know the, the, the clearest in one of the clearest ways of thinking about that is kind of in SRE type kind of terms where you're yeah. you're establishing an experiment and you're trying to define in the context of this piece of work how will I determine whether this is good or not and, and that's where your value measures come in because they're so contextual I, I don't know I don't know how you'd come up with a measure of value that isn't contextual I don't think there is a measure of value I don't think you can measure. So that's the first issue is people are always wanting one, right? They want some number for value and there isn't one. But, you know, again, you, you look at, it's easy to have high numbers in the Dora metrics and still be doing things really wrong, mm -hmm. right? So deployment frequency is one, uh, mean time to recovery. Um, well, maybe the reason you have to recover is because you had an experiment and the experiment didn't work, right? So, um, <clears throat> Certainly being able to roll back quickly in that situation is good. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, um, sometimes even that's not possible, right? The, the, the things like deployment frequency, well, sometimes it's better to move more slowly and produce more value, and the, the, which means you'll be deploying less frequently. Now, less frequently to me means you're deploying weekly instead of daily or hourly, mm -hmm. but it's still slower, right? And you deploy stuff and it doesn't work. It's a disaster. So you have to roll it back. Well, that's sort of, that's kind of, because we're working in lean space with the door metrics, that's seen as bad, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of, the thing about lean in general and Dora is not, doesn't escape this trap is that ultimately lean thinking is about running a factory. That's where it all started. So a lot of the basic concepts that underline lean simply are not applicable in a software environment. And even let's get something basic like a Kanban board, right? A Kanban board assumes that you have a linear process and you don't go backwards. And that is the opposite of overworking in an agile way, right? With an agile team is going to work in a very gestalt kind of way is that they'll, they'll only be working on one thing at a time, but everybody will be working on the same thing. So now we have a Kanban board with one column in it. And what use is that? And the, the, um, the idea of you can't go backwards, the rework is bad, right? Classic lean waste rework is one of the classic eight wastes. And, um, but we go back all the time. That's what Agile is all about, is trying stuff and rolling back and mm -hmm. cycling around in these loops inside of loops inside of loops inside of loops. So as soon as you start focusing too much on lean, you end up thinking that things are bad that are in fact good. Now, that's not to say there's nothing valuable there. There's a huge amount of value there. Kaizen is essential, 
right? If we're not, and, but that's another thing that agile teams get wrong, right? Is they say, oh, we're having a retro every two weeks. That's not Kaizen, right? Kaizen is continuous. It's like, you're always yeah. looking for problems. And as soon as you find them, you fix them. Yeah. And we don't have a retro every two weeks. We don't like sit on some problem until the next retro comes up is what's that about? And the, the, um, the, uh, we need intelligence. <laughs> Maybe that's what I'm saying. Yeah, right? gotta, yeah, yeah. We can't we can't just kind of mindlessly saying lean is good, right? Kanban is good. We've got to we've got to drop Scrum and do Kanban. And I'm going, what's that about? You can do Scrum and Kanban at the same time, just fine. Is what's the problem? And the, the you know and the, around and around and around is there's all this kind of weird conceptions about how to do stuff, and it, it doesn't work. I'm I'm working on a new book right now. It, 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 people on Twitter have been after me to write a book again. Um, I kind of stopped writing books because I got fed up with working that hard to get some, to write something and then only get a 10% return on it because the publishers took 90% yeah. for themselves. And now that everything is electronic, the fact that some publishers still want to take 90% for themselves drives me effing crazy. Yeah. So, but now that, now that self-publishing has become a real option, I'm sort of thinking, okay, I'll write another book. And this, what the title of this book is hashtag no. And it's sort of no estimates, no sprints, no projects, just kind of systematically go through everything that people do wrong in a, in a faux agile shop and say, here's the practice, here's the problem, here's how to fix it with every one of, with every one of those things. And we need more of that. And too, too much of the coaching community is afraid to say no. Um, mm -hmm. I pitched this book to O'Reilly and O'Reilly uh, junked it. They said, it's too negative. And I'm going, well, <laughs> somebody's got to be negative. Somebody at some point, has got to say this is not working. Yeah. And you can talk about things that do work forever, but that doesn't actually help people because they're doing things that aren't working thinking that they are. And you need to sort of talk about what's not working as well as what's working. And they just would yeah. not buy that. But that that's just reflecting an attitude that I see in a lot of the coaching community. Um, when I say something on Twitter that's explicit, I mostly the, the, the hardcore coaching people have given up on me at this point, which is fine with me. But back when I started doing that, they would dump on me, you know, sort of on a, you can't say that. And, you know, but there's this corner case. And I go, so <laughs> there are always corner cases. So what, right? A corner case does not prove the premise wrong. Yeah. Right. All that a corner case says is that there are exceptions. Well, I won't argue with that. Of course there are exceptions. There are always exceptions. There is no universal truth. But if, if this is Twitter, there's 280 characters or 240 characters. <laughs> and if I, if, I, if, I, if I were to qualify every tweet with, in my opinion, it seems to me that in some situations, <laughs> this is true. I wouldn't have any Five characters, characters left. to say anything, right? <laughs> so, so I kind of took the position early on that when it came to Twitter, I was just going to say what was on my mind. And if people want to discuss that, that's fine. Yeah. But um, the the um, all too often, though, in the community, in the coaching community, people are walking on eggshells. They're kind of saying, oh, we can't really say it. We believe this. Mm -hmm. We know this is a problem, but we can't really say that because, well, I don't know why, because I know they're thinking if we say it out loud, people will rebel against it or something or, you know, interpret it as me throwing my weight around. And I'm going, you're being hired <laughs> as an expert is that yeah. sharing your expertise is not throwing your weight around is what you were hired to do. Yeah. So I, I, I'm, I have kind of issues with a lot of the coaching community right now. That and I have issues with them conflating um, life coaching with agile coaching is that the, the whole life coaching thing, right? All the certified life coaches and all that kind of stuff. I, yeah. That has no relevance at all for agile coaches. Is that we're, we're, what we're coaching is, is the mechanics of doing agile. Right? We're like baseball coaches. We don't care about people's lives particularly. What we care about is how fast they can throw the ball and how accurately and whether they can hit it. Yes. And you know, and the, the if if we spent our time saying, well, I really could help you be a better batter. But let's talk about your marriage, right? And I'm going, <laughs> <laughs> what value am I providing if I do that? Right? But a lot of coaches are kind of doing that is that they've gone so much to the so-called soft skills. I hate that term, but they're going to the, so much to the soft skills that they lose, lose track of the fact that we're trying to develop software here, guys. And we're trying to develop software as effectively as we can. And we're trying to develop software that provides real value to people. So that the, the things that we're creating are the things that will actually make people's lives better. 
And let's yeah. focus on that. Right, let's focus on that. That's the more important that, thing. That that kind of brings me to a to a, to to a thought. There's so much stuff in in what you just said, and there's all all different things that I want to talk about now. But so 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 so, so I, I I did a book on Lean Pub last year. You should you should definitely didn't self publish. It's a nice experience. Yeah. But um but um but there's there's so much stuff. But one one of the things that I was kind of intrigued to talk to you about was um. I, 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 you're a very opinionated person, uh, as, a, Me? as am I. Opinion? As am I. <laughs> <laughs> Moi? <laughs> and and I, 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 I think that's it. I think that's important. Uh, and it started me thinking about, you know, the, the, so, so, so how how do you make how do you make this kind of change in organisation? I've I've got the approaches that I use to try and help organisations become genuinely agile and genuinely apply some of the ideas that we're talking about. Um, um, but it's hard. And as you as you've alluded to, I, I think just now, it, it's not always about being being nice to everybody all of the right. time. You've, right. There's got to be some harsh truths uh, right. at times. And there's the question of kind of leadership you know you, you you very you very vocally kind of talk about managers and and kind of leaders in organizations as as largely being dysfunctional which i would you know yeah. i see a lot of that too uh, very often but there is a role for leadership of technical teams there's that there are you know there's the necessity of some forms of training wheels to help people you know, learn the skills that they need I'm to get to the stage. Sure. I'm not sure about that. There, there's a okay. role for leadership, but there's no role yes. for management. Yeah, yeah, okay. And Goodbye all too that. often yeah. people conflate those terms is that man yeah. mere managers want to call yeah. themselves leaders, makes them feel yeah. good. When they're not leaders, right? You're not yeah. a leader. You can't impose a leader on somebody. Yeah. You know, and the um and the the opinions. Let's talk about it. Let's start by talking about opinions. I was reading a philosophy piece maybe in the Atlantic, I don't remember where it was a few weeks ago. And the author was saying, he was talking about somebody saying, well, I'm entitled to my opinion. And the author was saying, no, you're not. Nobody's entitled to an opinion. You're entitled to be able to back up your opinion with logic and prove that your opinion has some validity. Yeah. But just having an opinion, you're not entitled to that unless you can back it up. And I kind of agree with that, right? And a lot of what's what I see is people bowing to that i'm entitled to my opinion thing and yeah. they shouldn't right particularly if that opinion is some is a opinion that management holds and a lot of those opinions are kind of kanban or not kanban <laughs> kahneman style um fast thinking opinions yeah i just got gut feeling business has we have to do estimates that's the way businesses work yeah which is classic kahneman fast thinking yeah i'm going no let's think about it yeah right so you know, how do you do it though, practically speaking, kind of getting back to sort of the, there are about five things to talk about in what you just said. <laughs> but practically, hopefully I remember them all, but practically speaking, um, what I'd like to do as a consultant is I like to spend a week or so just kind of looking around. And I want to sit down with the sea levels and I want to say, what's keeping you up at night? Mm -hmm. what, what are the business problems that you're having? What are the problems you're having with the way the business runs? And then we try and narrow that down to the most important one. And then we say, okay, how do we fix it? Mm -hmm. And I just focus on that one problem. I'm not trying to do an agile transformation, whatever the hell that means, right? I'm just saying, okay, we have one problem. Usually that problem is we're not getting stuff out the door fast enough. Um, not always, but usually that's what the, that's the stated problem. And then I say, so let's figure out why. And then you do things like put together a value stream map. Mm -hmm. Try and figure out where the bottlenecks are and look at work in progress and that kind of stuff. And then I fall typically into Mike Rother mode and, and go, okay, so our goal is to increase, is to get stuff out. And of course, we want it to be valuable stuff. There's no point in just more output. So let's try this one thing and see what happens. And if that works, let's try this other thing. And if it doesn't work, let's try this third thing, right? Yeah. And sort of go with this, these sort of inc small incremental experiments that move you in the direction of the goal of getting stuff, more stuff out the door. And people don't resist that, right? Because the what we're doing is we're focusing on a specific problem. 
a specific solution that is inexpensive to try. Mm -hmm. And so there's very little risk. And if, and uh, some kind of goal, you need some, not necessarily a number, but some way of indicating the progress is being made. So if we see progress in that experiment, that means the experiment succeeded and we can move on to the next experiment. And that, that of course is an agile way of installing agile, but yeah. the, the, um, that works for me. I don't know if it can work for everybody, but it works for me. And too often when I see agile being installed, it's like the, you know, the big three consulting approach, the Deloitte approach. We're going to bring in an army of people and we're going to force you to completely change things into the way we say you should be doing working. Yeah. And that never works. Right. It's the, the for, for one thing, there's no, the, the, um, in one of the pop and Dick books, I don't remember which one, but one of the lean software books, the early lean software books, they talk about the Numi plant down in Fremont this is down the yeah. road for me, uh, which is now the Tesla plant. And the, the, originally that was a GM plant and it was the, the worst factory in the world, just about yeah. by pretty much every measure, the highest absentee rates, their, their output was low. The quality of the cars was awful and just go through every measure <clears throat> in March is Toyota and Toyota starts doing this lean thing. And, um, very quickly, within six months, it turned around to being one of the best factories in the world. Mm -hmm. And they were producing extremely high quality stuff. They had no absentee rate and that kind of stuff. And they, Toyota, of course, was doing the Toyota thing. as the, They were saying, okay, well, the decisions have to be made at the place where the work happens. Yeah. So we're going to empower the teams to come up with ways of working that are that work, and we're going to give them a strategic goal. They're saying, which is right. It was lean. So saying, your goal is to eliminate as much waste as possible, mm -hmm. and we don't care how you do it. You're the ones that know how to build stuff, not us. Mm -hmm. So figure out how to do that, and they would do it, right? And they, all of the teams on the line, came up with better ways of working. So, General Motors, being General Motors, they said all right, so we're going to document all of this, which they do. And then they took this giant sack of paper and plonked it down in Detroit and said, okay, you guys are now going to do this. And it was an utter and complete dismal failure. Yeah. Just didn't work. And it's because what makes things work in the lean environment is the fact that the teams can make up processes that work for themselves. Yes. Right. And the whole, quote, agile transformation process, that doesn't work that way. Right? It's somebody telling somebody else what to do. As soon as somebody tells somebody else what to do, it's you, you failed. And the the so the real way to do an agile transformation is to educate people to the point where they can make good decisions mm -hmm. by giving them options and explaining how things work and that kind of stuff, and then allowing them to make the decision. That's the hard part from a management point of view is just training management to stop telling people what to do. Yeah. But um, <clears throat> the point is is that. If you do that, you'll have something that works well in your company. Is it going to work anywhere else? No. Right. And that, of course, is the huge problem with Scrum. We want to bring this back around to where we started half an hour ago, is that Scrum is a process that worked really well in whatever company Ken Schwaber was working in 20 years ago. Yeah. And I will not argue that. Worked well for him. Great. Mm -hmm. Will it work well for anybody else? No, probably not. Mm -hmm. Right, because the the process has to be developed by the people that are doing the work, and um, the whole notion of agile as a process is uh, sort of kind of fundamentally opposed to actual agile, which is a self-organizing team, self-organizing. Right, and there's no, there's no. It's not an accident that there are no. Actually, there's only one actual practice in the agile manifesto. Right. The only practice, concrete practice in the Agile Manifesto is the retrospective. Mm -hmm. And that's it. The sprints and backlogs and all of that garbage, right? None of that is Agile. All of that is stuff that was added later. later. It's, Except it's, for the retrospective. Yeah, just, right? just continuous just, just, improvement. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So, so, so I, 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 well, I, I, and continuous delivery. In, yeah. In, all so up, up, optimize with the continuous delivery of value. It's, Valuable right, but the agile part is the improvement yeah. part, right? They don't even talk really about delivery, except that we should be delivering useful software to people quickly. And I, I, I agree with that. Right? There's no, an implication so, of continuous, but they didn't do it continuous 20 years ago. 
Yeah. Right? But back when <clears throat> back when the actual manifesto was written, we didn't know how to do that yet. Yeah, yeah. So they were sure. they were delivering every week or two, which is fine. Yeah. But the yeah. the um the um or maybe even every month or two, right? Is that they actually bring out a month as a legitimate time interval in the manifesto. And I don't think anybody thinks that's a good idea anymore. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. but um the continuous improvement though, that's what makes a company agile is the fact yes. that they're constantly looking at how things they're welcoming change, right? They're looking at how things are working and saying, how can we change to make things better? It's 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 kind of related to what I was saying earlier about the um the kind of beginning of infinity idea the, the, the kind of thing i i think there are some deeper principles that do underpin um good great software development um and it, it's my i i think i you know I, i'm we've already said you know so, the Agile Manifesto. If there are any viewers that haven't read the Agile Manifesto, go and go and read it. It's 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 five it's, it's five five principles and twelve practices. It's, it's it's not a long read, but you will understand better what it is that we're talking I, about. You know, I, I I'm going to do do a little bit of shameless self promotion here, but the, um. I find that people sometimes have a hard time understanding the ramifications of the of the manifesto because it's so terse. Yes, so I put together this list of heuristics, like there's, I think there's 27 of them or something, that basically covers the same ground, but it's a little bit more specific about device. And I think that might be useful to people too. It's yeah, at, at uh, holo.com/heu, the first three letters of the word heuristics. We'll we'll and, put we'll put we'll put it we'll put a link in the description. Yeah. So, but that's there's nothing in that list which is not also in the actual manifesto yeah but it's just presented in a different way so you can get a somewhat different perspective yeah. on it because you know people look at the manifesto and they don't see the ramifications they say well it doesn't say this explicitly therefore it's not agile when in fact well but if you don't do this other thing you can't do the thing that's in the manifesto you know so we talk about sustainable pace for example in the manifesto well how do you get that yes Right. So to get a sustainable pace, well, you've got to have management that supports it. You've got to have, you know, teams set up to be to be self-organizing, which of course it also talks about. But the how do you get self-organizing teams in a in so a, that's 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 right? the thing that's the thing that I was I, I I guess I was I was kind of asking earlier on when I'm saying when I was saying about you know how do people like you and I help others to um get the benefits that we think are available if you know it, so so absolutely what you describe you know let's you know we can we can we can work and we can solve a problem with somebody and we, you know but my 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 wife is not a technologist she 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 worked in housing uh, in in right. the uk and she, but she's a very agile thinker and she would act as a consultant advising companies on how to do mm -hmm. some of this stuff for a while and she had a great idea which which i i like to i like I, I nick from her, which is what can, what can we do today that we can measure the impact of next week? You know, what what what, what you know what's what what's the small change that we can make and figure out whether that's moving us closer to where we want to be or or further away? You know, a, a little yeah. bit like the the, the Mike well, Rather well, stuff. That's, that that's, that's again that's sort of the rather improvement. It is, of, yeah. Approach, yeah, right? And, and again, link in the description. Toyota Carter. We'll put that there yeah. as well. <clears throat> yeah, but I, I wouldn't say measure though i would say uh, you need an indicator but that's not necessarily a measurement i'm nervous about the word measurement yeah i i i i um, i i'm 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 happy to concede that i'm talking loosely so 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 yeah. gathering feedback and interpreting the feedback is what i mean by measurement it doesn't have to be quantitative yeah. because the indicator could be people are happier well, yeah, yeah. That, how do you yeah, measure yeah. happiness right you can't measure happiness yeah and, you know the measure the we're producing more value out of you can, again you can't measure value is things like like net promoter score there's been volumes written on what's wrong with net promoter score it doesn't work right and the the um it's just not measurable so i engineers drop into numbers much too much too quickly and they put much much too too much emphasis on them I, if i hear the word data driven applied to running a software organization one more time, I'm going to pull my hair out or something is that, no, we're not data driven. 
And uh, I always find know. another thing to disagree on. <laughs> okay. You know, because the, well, look at the, you know, if often data driven means A B testing. But you look at companies that do A B testing, and the difference between A and B is in the noise level, but they still pretend that it's not. Yeah. Right. I want to see a 100% improvement in B, mm -hmm. not a 1% improvement. Yeah. Right. And the, the, but people who do the 1% improvement still use, trot out that we're data driven thing. Maybe it's, we're back to, I'm working for a lot of dysfunctional companies, but I have seen that too often. And the, the, the real issue is, are you making your customers' lives better? And can you determine that with data? And I think no, is you can determine things like how easy is it is to use the software. And there's a loose correlation between that and making people's lives better, right? Your life is always better if, if you don't have to work harder to get the same thing accomplished. But it doesn't tell us whether we're doing the right thing. And I, I would rather have all of the focus be on doing the right thing, doing, getting value. How do you know what the right thing is? By talking to people. How do, how do you know that they're not crazy? How do, how do you know that they're, that they're the right people? By talking to you, you don't need to know. It's the, 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 of course, there's an entire profession, a project manager, a product management rather, that is concerned with answering that question. Mm -hmm. But ultimately what a product manager does is talk to people. And the, the dysfunction comes into that when a product manager says, well, only I can speak for the customers as a group. Mm -hmm. You can go, you, you lowly engineer, you can, you can go talk to people, but that's just one person's opinion. I understand the group as a whole. And that's, that's nonsense. And the, I'm trying really hard to not say bullshit, but it's nonsense. <laughs> and the, <laughs> but the, the, um, the issue here is that um, there's nothing wrong with starting by talking to one person and doing what they need. That's a great start. Mm -hmm. And then you take that and you go off to five people and say, take a look at this and give me your, tell me what's wrong and what's right. And they'll give you some feedback and you tweak it a little bit more until all five of them are happy, or at least as happy as they can be. And then you take it out to 50 people and you say, take a look at this, tell me what's wrong, what's right. And, you know, once you get about 50, that's probably all you need. Um, you know, Ivor Jakobsen famously, or not, it wasn't Jakobsen, uh, Nielsen, um, 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 Jakob Nielsen famously said that all you need is three. Mm -hmm. right, to, in the way of feedback, right? And um, that might be too low, but certainly 50 is the most you'll ever need in order to get a good feeling for the market as a whole if you choose, choose your 50 carefully. But the, the, the point is, is that there's nothing wrong with starting with one. So I, 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 so, so, uh, sure, I, I, absolutely. I, 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 just, I just quibble over what you've described to me is collecting data, but, but it's, you know. It's, yeah, but it's, that's not really, that, that is collecting data in a fashion. Right, yeah. because well, it's, the it's, feedback it's, that you're it's, getting it's, is a kind of data, uh, but the, 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 but it's not the, numbers. It's not numbers. It's not metrics. sure, but but, but you know, it, it's it's the it's problem. Sure, it's so, so fastly, but it, but <laughs> the problem that I have a lot is that people demand numbers. They reject that whole approach because they said it's nothing numeric there. I don't think that's I can't the same. As, I don't. I don't think that's necessarily the same as data driven. The, the advantage of numbers okay. is you can start playing statistical games with them. But as you pointed out, quite correctly you've got to be fairly sophisticated in the way of your thinking and organizing that. I think one of the things that I'm, I'm coming to is that, is that, is that you're, you know, you're, I, I think like me, uh, you think that software development is hard and you need smart people to do it and you need to let the smart people do it. I remember back, I haven't actually heard this in a while, but back when I first started talking about agile, somebody would come up to me and say, yeah, but, isn't it true that you can't do this at all unless you have a bunch of smart and motivated people? Yeah. I'm going, yeah. <laughs> you, 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 you can't do anything if you don't have a bunch of smart and motivated people. So what's your point? That we need to be able to hire idiots and have them follow scripts and that's not going to work? So that doesn't work with any kind of software development, no matter how you do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I once I once had uh, a, a, um, a career review in one of the organisations that I worked in, and um, and the feedback that I got was Davis shown that he can work well 
with the best people, the best teams, but he's yet to prove that you can work with people that are less capable. And I said, I don't want to. <laughs> I'm not interested in, in, that, in that part. That was a long well, that, time that's, ago. <laughs> that's one answer. The other answer that I would give in that situation is, so let's make the less capable people more capable. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> I, it's, 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 one of, it's one of my things. So I, I, I have a uh, part partly because of the continuous delivery thing i have a bit of a a bad reaction to feature branching because yeah. um it delays feedback it gets right. in the way of being the clarity of whether as stuff is and i don't think it's compatible with continuous integration which right. you know you know we, we both we both value very highly so but but one <laughs> one of my things is you know if you're using that because you don't if you're using feature branching so that you can do pull requests so that you can kind of gate key access to your production system because you don't trust your teammates your problem is the trust not the version control system <laughs> so fix the trust problem and get the you know get the people yeah. trustworthy to work with you it's a cultural yeah. problem it's it's it, uh, it drives me nuts yeah and i have you know, it's, i i hear this a lot from people that are coming from eastern europe for some reason but there's this i think of as the myth of the slacker mm -hmm right is that they're constantly bringing up slackers right you know like, we yeah. can't do that because people will will not work they'll you know they'll take advantage of the situation and sit on their butts and not work and i usually i say have you ever actually seen that and the answer is well no so <laughs> why are we talking about it right but yeah, yeah. maybe and maybe they do see it occasionally i don't know i've never seen it yeah I, 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 I saw a I saw a great blog post uh, a, a few years ago, which was talking about servant leadership. And yeah. and the, the woman that wrote, I can't remember her name, but but I, I did enjoy it. She said it's not really like being it's not servant le leadership. It's more like hosting a party. You kind of put out all of the stuff and you put the drinks and you you hope that people will have a nice time. And occasionally you've got to throw out the drunks. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, I quite I quite liked that as an analogy. Yeah, but you know, even throwing out the drunks, you could you could argue, well, this is a you know, is a valuable person to have when they're not drunk. So let's walk, well, let's work on that drunks thing, right? <laughs> you know, in other words, you can the 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 when I see people that are quote underperforming, mm -hmm. almost always the problem is one of training and mentorship, not in, inherent yeah. personality problems. Yeah. And, um, you know, I see so much active, active dysfunction around that individual performance reviews, which end up with finger pointing, you better get better or else. Mm -hmm. And then Am Amazon has this insane thing where they, if somebody is quote underperforming, what they do is give them an insane amount of work to do. And if they don't finish it on time, they're fired. Yeah. You know, what the hell is this about? Right. Is that the proper response to somebody who's underperforming is to find out why and fix mm -hmm. it. Yeah. It's something they don't know. Um, maybe they're just in the wrong job. That's fine. Let's find something else for them to do somewhere else in the company. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the point is, is that people for the most part want to do a good job. They're competent. They, they want to be happy. They want to be doing something that's satisfying to them. So let's figure out how to make that work and do it. And it's not about punishment. And the, the throwing out the drunks part goes to punishment too easily sometimes is that the, the right is that there, there are a lot of steps that you should take before you go to punishment. Yeah. And, you know, and the, the, uh, you know, the other direction happens too, right? Hiring is the, the teams ought to be able to hire their own people. It shouldn't be some manager hiring people. It certainly shouldn't be some, some human resources, a shudder at that term, but some human resources person hiring hiring people the very fact that they're using the word resources and human in the same sentence tells me that they've got no business hiring people yeah but the the um you know i my best <laughs> i once back when i was doing more contract programming kind of stuff um was in an interview before they were that i was you know before to, to come up to a contract and it was one of these kind of Google style interviews where they give them questions and answers. And this was some HR person reading the questions off a list. And she had a list, list of proper answers. And she asked me a question that was an exam question that I had invented and given to my class about two semesters earlier. Mm -hmm. It was my question. I invented it. <laughs> 
<laughs> and she gave me that question. Clearly one of my ex-students was working for that company and that question filtered into their HR department. And I answered it and she just said, no, that's not the right answer. <laughs> and, and, and the question was kind of complicated. I couldn't exactly explain to her why she was wrong. But the, the question, which, which is an interesting question that I, that I, this is an interesting exercise for anybody that, that is a C or a C++ programmer, is write, a, the, quest, the, the problem was write a, a function, a subroutine, that returns the size of its own stack frame in bytes. Mm -hmm. Interesting exercise. And what am I going to do? Try and explain to her what a stack frame is? And uh, you know what what the address of a variable means, and how does recursion work, and all you know all this other stuff that you need to solve that problem. I'm not going to be able to say to an HR person, "You're wrong because." Yeah. They just yeah. had the questions and the answers, the jumping through hoops thing, right? So as long as we're we can't have agile companies as long as we're hiring from laundry lists and doing these ridiculous Google intelligence tests, quest, you know, and whiteboard interviews and all this other craziness, which doesn't do a damn thing. You know, and the, 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 so on the, we started talking about the firing side, the hiring side, if a team says to somebody, we look through your resume and you look pretty good, come in and work for us for a morning and we'll pay you. Mm -hmm. Right. That's going to give you useful information. Yeah. No amount of white, and it's agile, right. Is yeah. again, we're, we are going to sort of work with somebody and incrementally make a decision about whether we want to continue to work with this person or not. Yeah. Um, yeah. There are we used companies. To, we used, we used, we, well. Yeah, I, 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 I worked in companies that did that. We we, we yeah. used to take a very long time to hire people just just to figure out whether they you know they they fit with the team. Yeah, but even then, it doesn't have to take a long time. It's kind of like dating, right? If you go on a if you go into a dating site and you try and pick somebody with those those profiles, that's craziness. You can't, right? You you know within microseconds of meeting somebody whether you're going to get along or not. So, so, I, so I, th I think we do it on we, paper for hours and it won't tell you that. Right? So I think, I think we've learned matter. two important things about Alan. One is that he's worked for a lot of bad employers and <laughs> he's, he's never had a bad date. <laughs> I had bad dates, but that's the point that I'm trying to, that's the point that I'm making, right? If, if you're, if you're taking a dating site approach, right, where you have this giant catalog of people. And you're going through lists of skills and comparing it against your laundry yeah. list, right? This is a, this is very much the way hiring works in many organizations. Yeah, yeah. And, and it doesn't work. Yeah. Right. You Absolutely. can go. You can go through those profiles until you're blue, and they tell you nothing about whether you're going to get along with the other person or not. You don't find that out until you yeah. sit down and have a chat. Yeah. Right? Well, I, 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 I always right face to face. I I I, 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 I do agree. I, I I one of one of the things. One of the things that I always I always do when in interviewing people is is just imagine working with them and would I would I be in, would I enjoy working with them would I would I feel excited to be working with them is this somebody yeah. I can learn from is this somebody kind of fun with you know I, th I think that's you know, yeah I think that's that an important much thing more than any of the other stuff yeah you yeah, know, yeah. So we're building do you know Ruby <laughs> how long does it take to learn Ruby what's the, yeah. what's the problem here right is yeah. that uh, I'm much more interested in all that other stuff. Yeah, so, I, I, absolutely. I, I, I've hired people that didn't have the technologies that we were working with. Uh, in yeah, the so past. have I. And I, uh, you know, and I because think somebody good will learn, will will pick it up in no time. Yeah, you know what made me think in these terms is that kind of my mentor when I first started programming, my very first programming job, the the sort of brilliant, competent person who was helping me. Um, what he did in his past life is that he was a machinist. Mm -hmm. Right, and he came into programming knowing nothing about programming, and was hired knowing nothing yeah. about programming. But what he did have was uh, was a personality that gave a lot of attention to detail, mm -hmm. and a personality that was focused on problem solving. Because right? you need yeah. both of those things in order to be a good machinist. Yes, and those are the key skills. Whether he knew some programming language or another, who cares? Is they did, in fact, yeah. and the company was enlightened enough to hire him, even though he didn't have those particular skills. Yeah, that sort of set a benchmark for me. There's a lesson there, right? That, that yeah, yeah. Here's this guy who's like the best programmer in the company, and he's not really a programmer, at least not. He is now, but he sure yeah. wasn't when he was hired. Yeah. And the the we need more of that, I think. And the the whole notion of the the labor shortage that people are talking about now, there isn't a labor shortage. Mm -hmm. There are millions of English majors that would be overjoyed to get a programming job. Yeah. 
sure, they don't know how to program, but the things that you need to do to write a good research paper are very similar to the skills that you need to have write a good program. Yeah, it's but, yeah, it's, it's 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 one of those other failures, as I see, of of, of the software industry is that employers are not willing to allow people to learn. It's ludicrous. You, you, you aim, aim to try and hire people that have exactly the technology that you're using, solving exactly the kind of problem that you're solving, and you expect them to come in. Yeah, I want to hire some. I want to hire somebody who's smart, who's going to, you know, grow over time and 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 be better than all of us. Ideally, you know that that's Ab absolutely you know, <clears throat> that, that dysfunction is so built into our culture, though. Yeah, yeah. All of those moronic politicians that talk about STEM. <laughs> right. I could care less about STEM. Makes no difference. You know, going through some STEM program in school does not make you a good programmer. It tells you nothing. It's not predictive of anything useful. And the, the you know, I'd much rather hire a philosophy major than a mathematician. Um, but it's built in. Right. I, I remember the struggles I had when my kids were young with other parents who were saying, oh, these eight year olds have got to get on computers. So they're going to be relevant. And I'm going, no. They need to learn to interact with other human beings. That's the important skill. And at eight, that's the skill they should be working on. Not yep. sitting in front of a damn computer all day doing some kind of bizarre exercise. Is that what's that going to do? Yeah. And the but they the other parents it was a hard sell. They couldn't get. They were so sucked into the we have to have computer skills, we have to have STEM skills, et cetera, et cetera, that they completely sidetracked the skills that they really did need to have yes. in favor of these ones that were secondary. Yes. And that's that's almost built into the culture right now. It's very, very difficult to argue in the educational system that, no, you don't need math to be a programmer. You know, a, se a, se a semester of discrete math is plenty. A little bit of stat, a little bit of set theory, a little bit of a little bit of logic. And that's fine. That's all you need. And but what you do need is to be able to talk to people, to be able to take your thoughts and get them written down in a coherent way that other people can understand, uh, to be able to organize yourself in a way that allows that to happen, uh, to be able to do research, right? These are all, the, these are the key skills. Yeah. They're often de-emphasized in the whole educational system in order to, in, in favor of things like NP completeness. I, I could care less about NP completeness. <laughs> and the, why are you teaching? Why are you, you know, why does your your grade depend on getting a good a good grade in a class that teaches you about big O notation and NP completeness? I just don't care. And the the algorithms is I don't care about algorithms anymore. I use they're fun. I like it. Right? Maybe maybe a good hiring criteria is you think algorithms are fun. But whether you know them or not, who cares, right? If I need an algorithm, I'll look it up in Google as I'm not going <laughs> to. <laughs> craziness. So we're, we're emphasizing the wrong things. And then, yeah, yeah, and then, yeah. And so, I think, so, you know, Agile is about emphasizing the right things. Yes. So, 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 I, you know, the, the, the heart of that you, you mentioned already, I think, at least I think is, 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 you know, inspect and adapt, which is, you know, one of those deeper principles, which is, I think agile is really aligned with kind of scientific right. philosophy. Be skeptical, have an open mind, you know, don't trust, don't trust your guesses and try and figure out how you're going to validate your thinking and all that kind of stuff. And that seems to me to be, you know, at the heart of it, we're, we're, we're running out of time. So, 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 you know, we've been, we've both been slightly grumpy old men through, through, through this conversation <laughs> mostly. So, so, so what, what, how, what would you pick up as advice that you'd offer to people that might be watching this that can help them to you know do a better job what one thing we've mentioned already is read the read the agile manifesto you know rather than the scrum Sorry. the scrum documentation read the agile manifesto as a starting point um part of it is that i think you need to particularly when people are very junior they need to understand what's important and what's not so that, that they can make choices about things like where they want to work. Yeah. Right. As often, often there's this level of desperation about getting a job that's working against people. Yeah. And even if you don't know agile, I would do something like read Dan Pink's drive mm -hmm. and say, do I want to work for a company that works like this? Yeah. And if the answer is yes, then go out and find companies that work like that. Yeah don't accept the, whatever the first job that comes along is, at least in the current job climate, you can do that, 
right? Is that yeah. maybe five years from now, you won't be able to do it. But right now we're sort of in a golden age for job seekers, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you can, you can choose is that getting a job is not the company choosing you, it's you choosing the company. Yes. And right. And the, the, if a company can't hire people, the problem is not that there's some kind of skills lack lacking. The problem is that nobody wants to work for them. Yes. Right. If you're, if you're in a company that can't hire somebody, then I would say, fix your company. Yeah. Make your company uh, so good. Everybody wants to work for you. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and that's the kind of market economics I'm in favor of. <laughs> Skinnerian condition. My advice is to, is to read about stuff like that, about things that are, thing, figure out what's going to make you happy and do that. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and easy enough, not easy enough, but basic enough. Yeah, basic enough. Uh, well, uh, uh, we should probably wrap up. That that's great. I I, I I'd reinforce your point about the da the Dan Pink stuff and uh, thinking about you know those intrinsic motivators rather than the extrinsic ones and all that kind of stuff. It's it's all good stuff. No, um, let me throw in sort of a moment of shameless self promotion is. Go to my website and hire me. <laughs> I, right, I'm a consultant. I'm always looking for jobs. Um, I'm I'm always doing classes. I've got a class coming up shortly on story development. On yeah, cool. User stories and that kind of stuff is that uh, holdup.com. I list all the stuff. Follow me on Twitter. We'll put um, some links in the description. I have links in the description. Put links in the description and and I you know I've, if you need some help being more agile in the sense that the two of us have been talking about for the last hour. Um, I can help with that. So <laughs> hire me. <laughs> please, please, please hire me. Hire me. <laughs> this is the cry of the consultant. <laughs> so, so, so there's your answer, everybody. If you want to be yeah, right. really agile, hire Alan. Oh, you'll there be you fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much. L You're let welcome. me just say thank you to everybody for watching today. If you've enjoyed the content today, hit subscribe. And if you, you've really enjoyed it, hit like as well. Um, I'd like to thank Alan for, for joining me for the conversation. It's been a lot of fun to uh, be rubbish, rubbishing the world organizations and Agile in particular. Uh, but but we're, as you can probably tell, tell we're, we're both, uh, I think, real believers that there's something important here that's worthwhile mm -hmm. studying. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you very much indeed. And goodbye. Bye-bye. Take care.